Okay, so we're on the uh, final stretch before break, and uh, you have heard some really top-notch uh, speakers. Can you hear me? With the mic? Okay. okay. So I, I think that you know the main point of uh, my talk is to really identify kind of where the rubber hits the road, and to really give all of us permission to think about well. We've heard about all of these lofty goals, <laughs> but how do we get there? And, and also to give you guys a sense of when you go back to your home institution, that you're not alone thinking about some of the just nitty gritty barriers that kind of make some things happen around mobile health. And um, one of the things that's really important here is uh, I am um, a unicorn, as Dr. Chevy would say, and all of you are unicorns. And I'm, I'm really really proud to be part of that club. I'm also very proud that I'm one of the 20% of physicians that after practicing for 20 years, I'm really still excited about what I do. Um, I'm a child psychiatrist, I'm a health services researcher, and now I'm an mHealth wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, anyway, so I wanted just to share with you sort of a little bit about my world. and. Um, in addition to uh, being a professor, really one of the best departments in psychiatry and um, getting top-notch training in health services research, I am also a part-time psychiatrist for the LA County Department of Juvenile Justice Mental Health. Okay? This is my office. They call it the medication closet because it's the smallest office in a trailer. Okay? <laughs> so how many people who work in the county system can you relate to that? Okay, so we have a few. Okay, so just a couple of years ago, we had an EHR in some place. It's um, Cerner. And um, the EHR system was purchased. It only connects for juvenile justice. So I can connect to the primary care doc in juvenile hall. The primary care doc can see my records. I can see social work records. Probation cannot see my records, partly because it's protected um, from HIPAA. But this little system cannot connect with other community mental health centers, cannot connect with other departments of mental health facilities. We're just on our own little uh, gerbil, gerbil wheel here. In addition, in our EHR system, um, I lovingly say that I think we've sort of digitized its function. So what we've done is, you know, I was really excited as a health services researcher. We finally have an electronic healthcare record system we finally can able to see like the primary care doc records. And um, you know, in kids of juvenile justice, lie. Okay, <laughs> lie. But their lab tests don't lie. Their physical exam does not lie. Um, sometimes I can talk to probation. I get a lot of dirt. But that really helps me understand how to take care of these kids. But the bottom line is that they're still filling out forms. And instead, the forms are scanned in or the form is in the EHR, and I'm still putting in sort of open-ended text boxes. So as a health services researcher, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how in the world do I create a study variable based on even my EHR records? So that's where we're at. Um, and as far as counting principles and thinking about mental health, and I, I would have to argue that um, although there's been tremendous advances in thinking about how to use mobile health to change behavior to improve health, I think that there's a fair amount still we need to do to think about how do we leverage all of these wonderful things we're learning about mobile health technology to actually improve the basic delivery of mental health care to our most vulnerable patients. Mental health problems, as you know, are common, treatable, and costly. You know, adherence to national treatment guidelines are expected to be associated with improved uh, clinical outcomes. And I say that only because of the quality measures that are approved on a national level to improve child mental health, there's no established clinical validity that if we adhere to these recommended measures, that children improve. Then that's 2010. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about here, another guiding principle for mobile health or mental health. Communication is key for good care. And as you know, we've also thought about, you know, the the surgeon or the PA, you know, in front of the computer, the patients at the bedside, you know, maybe you can still provide good care. But I would argue that in mental health, you have to have good communication. You have to have good communication to make a diagnosis, to make a good decision about treatment. 
Um, you need to have a good therapeutic relationship that grows over time. Believe it or not, people don't really tell you sensitive information on that first visit, right? We need to include other decision makers, and particularly working with children and youth. We need to think about parents, adult caregivers, others in that child's life, and the cross providers. And this is a big deal, uh, particularly for mental health care, is we're not talking about just care coordination between a primary care doc and especially mental health doc, but we're talking about coordinating care across very diverse sectors, schools, foster care, juvenile justice, residential treatment facilities. Also, the shared decision process may shift over time, which is also going to be really important in thinking about how we adapt to mental health interventions. So child development is always on the axis when we're thinking about um, interventions for children, both pediatric and also child psychiatric. And also another big issue is the clinical status of the patient that you're caring for and expected to be using mobile health might be changing. And one of the big issues that comes up is legal authority and competence, right? So mental health care for vulnerable populations, I hope you will agree with me, is a bit complicated. Care is often multi-level, both at the patient, family, community, and system level. And here is a particular challenge. If you think about this child, where do you begin to develop mental health interventions to prevent and to early intervention for a child like that? The other issue is that we've talked a lot about how access to care is often poor. And again, if you think about it, even within the LA County Department of Mental Health, Juvenile Justice Mental Health System, remember, my EHR doesn't connect with anybody else. Just key terms, and again, um, not this is certainly well, well known to clinicians, but in working with a child psychiatrist, um, an engineer may hear words like DSM uh, diagnostic criteria, evidence based psychotherapy, psychotropic medication class, and side effects. Uh, treatment guidelines, national quality measures, treatment fidelity, medication titration. That's really where it's going to be pretty exciting about how can we start to adapt mobile health interventions to more personalize this process of titrating the med to reduce the risk of side effects to improve sort of uh, not only adherence, but also that when you're adjusting the cycle form of that, of that patient, how do you get it just right so that you're adjusting your you're addressing the target symptom, but you're not also over medicating. So I, I believe that um, in healthcare, can, can a group access to mental health care, continuity, adherence, communication, coordination, and even patient-centered care, but we've got a long way to go. And so I think one thing we need to think about, and it's coming up in T4, is how do we also leverage our community partners? Um, and thinking about our end users. And our end users for mobile health and mental health are particularly special. We've got our consumers. We've got caregivers of children with mental health problems. I would also argue that we have, a, we have caregivers of adults with mental health problems that also need support. We have providers from multiple disciplines and settings. We have issues of quality assurance and agency leaders. Um, and also within our large network, we cannot forget our social scientists and their beautiful theories that we really need to benefit more from to thinking about as we approach in mental health intervention, how can we leverage all of the rich social science about what we know about what drives humans and begin to adapt this to improving the quality of mental health care. Our methodologists are key and oftentimes um, my role is to provide methodologists data sets that defy a lot of the assumptions. Um, and so we really need to be continuing to feed our data back to try to help improve our methods. So here's just an example of a very humble start. It's called Mobile Health for Mental Health. Um, and um, I, in my mind, had this concept uh, both as a mother, as a child psychiatrist, and as a health services teacher. And I picked ADHD because it was a common problem. Three to seven percent of U.S. children is treatable. There's adverse long-term effects um, if not treated, and it's costly. The cost for ADHD is actually higher than that of pediatric asthma. 
The National Treatment Guidelines, whoever require use of standardized rating scales to make a diagnosis. And has anybody ever used paper forms to get rating? Okay. With children coming through backpacks in school. Okay, that's where we're at. That is where we're at, and that is compliant with national treatment guidelines. Unfortunately, we know medication follow-up visits are very brief, and the quality of care in the community is poor. Then on 2005. Okay, so how do we use mental health technologies to target? Improving uh, clinic visit attendance, medication adherence, parent-provider communication, and most importantly, for children, parent-centric medication management. Can you imagine what it's like for a parent? You've got a seven or eight year old little boy, you're told the child has ADHD, and you're handed a prescription during that visit of a class two drug. Class two means you, it requires a triplicate prescription. Stimulants are class two drugs. That's kind of scary. Here's the system architecture for MH2. It's very simple, it's with a smartphone. Going up to the server, we've got um, reminders um, to the to the teacher with two emails. Again, uh, she rates the uh, symptoms, goes on to the server. It gets aggregated onto a clinician iPad, and both researchers and clinicians have access to the data. So here um, we have our medication reminders on the parent's smartphone, and you can see it's very simple, and it's also in UCLA colors. Um, medication, ratings, clinic visit, and um, settings. And, you know, this took a lot of usability testing. So what you see here is our low-income parents said, give me something that looks like Target. They wanted that. Okay. So our reminders are um, medication or daily. It prompts the parent to say, did, you, did the child take the medicine? Yes, no. And if they can't remember, well, what in the world is it called? What's the dose? Blah, blah, blah. They can push a button and it opens it up and it reminds them what the medicine is and how it was prescribed. On the parent interface, um, there's also clinic visit appointments. And our parents said, look, I don't want this bothering me every single day. I've got enough reminders. Just tell me a week beforehand, three days, and one day before the visit. One day before the visit, so I can get my act together and remember to put a note in for school and I'm going to go to the clinic. So that's what we did. And we also in, uh, put a button there. So where's the clinic? What's the address? How do I get there? What's the phone number? Push the button and it opens up. Okay, what's really important is that if there's national treatment guidelines that we're supposed to be getting standardized ratings on symptoms of children, and that's how we're supposed to base our medical decision on how to treat. Is it really, um, can you really make a decision based on a paper form that's filled out sometime, maybe a distressed parent only once during that variable interval of care? And the answer is that's maybe how it is, but what we did was we put into the smartphone the ratings. And so these are standardized ratings using the Vanderbilt. And what is really important here is that we're wondering if that will improve parents' confidence in because they have to rate their child. They need to decide whether that kid's going to take the meds. So can we improve parent confidence by just teaching them what the symptoms are? And also, the other thing that we don't talk about a lot is how do you get the doctor to buy into this thing? Where's the win-win? We talk a lot about, you know, empowerment of the patient, and that's really, really important. But how do we get the doctors on board to use this? So the win-win here is that if they use MH2, they're now the documentation of compliance with the National Treatment Guidelines using rating scales is done. So here's the parent interface. The other thing too is when we did the usability testing, um, they wanted little factoids about ADHD, but not a lot of information. The other thing they needed was they wanted support. They wanted to know that they were good parents, even though they had a child with ADHD. They wanted respect. They wanted to, they wanted comments in there like, we know you're doing a good job. Um, and so even in here, we've got a reply and it, and it varies between education factoids and this little um, supportive comment. But sometimes if you, if you push the button and you complete your adherence, guess what? 
You want me to attack the test R E S T E C T. Okay, and that's one of our most popular reply tests. Here also, it's really important if you're working with um, folks that are stressed out, busy days, and have team four. We've talked a lot about that. If the parent sets the timer of when she wants the reminders. And here's the doctor iPad. Um, excuse me, this is the my report. And what's important here is you can see the symptoms and the side effects building in the teacher. So the parent says, look, I don't want to be surprised when I come to the uh, visit. I want to see what the doctor's going to see. So we built in the my report. And each of these lines then is side effects, symptoms, and the teacher. So she can see ahead of time when the teacher's ready to get it. I think for sake of time, this is the medication adherence report. And again, for the physicians, what happens when you first start, you're asking about how's the medicine going, are you taking it? Um, we actually have here a calendar so that if the parent didn't enter a few days, um, there's a chance to sort of regroup, correct, um, and then we we'll recalculate the adherence because it's very important that if uh, oftentimes parents will say, yeah, oh, I'm taking the meds, right? Okay. But you don't, if the kid is still symptomatic and the mother was too shy to tell you she really wasn't getting the medicine, you don't want to increase the dose. Right? <coughs> and then here's a way to set the appointment um, for the provider for the next visit. And in our study right now, we're doing that ourselves, so we're not imposing on the frontline staff. This is again the same as what the doctor sees, and she can hover over all of this line and look at the types of side effects and the types of symptoms. Um, and here we have, of course, continuing challenges. Um, we've had a few server upgrades that cost some bucks, but they're fixed. Pilot testing in the community is slow, but I'd like to argue that, you know, um, by doing it this way, you're making a much stronger case that our underserved population can use mobile health and do it well. Um, compliance is a big issue. With HIPAA, IRB, we had to have approval from County Los Angeles Department of Mental Health. They have a whole tech core um, involved in uh, data privacy. So you'll notice on the interface, there's nothing on this that says ADHD. It's MH2. Okay. Um, and then also trademark and copyright issues. So um, I've, you'll meet uh, Kat Fibiger, uh later this week. Uh, she is a data programmer and an attorney which is pretty cool, okay? And um, I need to say thank you to her because um, she helped us, our team, to trademark MH2, Mobile Health to Mental Health to UC Region, and also uh, we're in the final stages of trademarking SM2, our Spanish version as well, to UC. Uh, the other issue about copyright is, and you know, as a physician, you think, oh, I have to learn about this. Um, it's really important that um, the measures, the standardized measures I've put on the MH2, um, they are available in public, but we did have to uh, change them a little bit to fit with the screen. Do you know what I mean? So we're urged to copyright that as well so that they their MH2 version. Um, funding sources, I'm very, very grateful to the UCLA CTSI and some state funding from the Center of Behavioral Excellence. Um, again, many of our community partners. <coughs> Um, and uh, we're now sort of, I'll be presenting at our general pediatric um, faculty meeting uh, early September and there's interest for using an H2 and UCLIP. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and so I think as we break, um, my question is where do we begin? 